Hi guys, in this video we are going to talk about bits, bytes, and binary. Basically, whenever you see any, you know, uh, documentaries or movies or anything about computers and you hear people talking about zeros and ones, that's what we're going to be talking about today. How a computer can use transistors that can be switched to off or on, zeros or, or ones, how we can use that basically to represent data. So the first thing that you need to know is that our smallest unit of data is called a bit. Remember that your computer has a bunch of little transistors built into it, basically little, little light switches that can be switched off or on. If we have a light switch that is switched to off, we can interpret that as the number zero. If one of the light switches is switched to on, we can interpret that as one. Um, now there's other ways of interpreting a single bit of data. You can interpret a zero as a no, or a one as a yes. You can interpret a zero as a false, or a one as a true. Uh, when we ask a single bit to represent a false or a true, we call that a Boolean value, and that's something I would make sure I would get into my notes. Um, basically, when you're talking about true-false logic, trues and falses, we're talking about Boolean logic. Now, if at any point in this video I'm going too fast, all you have to do is raise your hand and ask the sub to pause the video. Um, that should give you guys a couple seconds to catch up. I think these notes will go fairly quickly compared to if I was in class because I had a couple little activities that we were going to do, uh, but we're going to skip the activities and we'll just talk about what we would have done if I were in class. So don't, don't be shy about asking for the video to be paused at any point. Um, but, you know, a couple things to get into your notes. What a bit is and what a boolean is. All right, let's move on. Um, the main thing to remember here is that computers are not, you don't have actual zeros and ones floating around inside of them, right? When you when you see a movie that's that's talking about computers and computer hardware, you'll see zeros and ones flying around on computer screens. Um, but in reality, computers are physical machines. They have physical components inside of them. Um, they have basically transistors, which are kind of like little light switches that could be switched to an on or off position, essentially. Um, and when those switches flip, that's when we interpret those positions of those switches as zeros and ones. So a computer doesn't have zeros and ones inside of it. It has switches, and it's the way that we interpret the state of those transistors um, that give them their meaning as zeros and ones, trues and falses. Um, I have a little bit of information about different ways that we can store data on a computer. Uh, this You should take some nice notes on this. I think this is important informa information here. So when we're talking transistors, we're talking computer chips. Um, and a classic example would be RAM. So if you hear someone talking about the RAM on their computer, um, that's a, a way of storing, storing data using transistors. So these are just a bunch of little on-off switches. The special thing about RAM is it's your way of, your computer's way of storing temporary data because RAM needs a continuous electrical current in order to store memory. It's called volatile memory because if you turn the computer off, everything that's stored in RAM gets deleted. Um, that all goes away as soon as the computer loses current. Now, computers would not be super useful if they could only store data while they're turned on. Um, so we have ways of transferring data from RAM to other ways of storing it. Uh, flash memory is really popular right now. St uh, solid state drives, if you were to go online right now and try to buy a small, efficient, fast um, external hard drive for your computer, you would probably get an SSD, a solid state drive. Um, there's also those little USB drives that some of you guys bring to class to store your projects on, um, SD cards that go into digital cameras. Um, basically, these are still tiny on-off switches, but these do not require continuous current in order to store memory, so we call this non-volatile memory. Uh, the difference here, the reason you would want RAM versus flash memory, 
when we're talking RAM, we're talking about things that the computer can write to and read from very, very quickly. So RAM is great. People love having a lot of RAM on their computer because it's great temporary fast storage that your computer can use. And if you ever have something in RAM that you need to save, you just write that to your flash memory for saving for the long term. Now flash memory is good because this data can be stored long term. If the device loses electricity, if the battery runs out, you don't lose any of this data that's in your solid state drive or your USB drive, um, but it is a little bit slower to read and write from it. Magnetic, magnetic storage. This is getting less and less popular, but back when I was your age, the only, the only option for storing data um, was hard disks. Uh, you could still buy these, so you could still buy a hard drive um, that has a magnetic disk on it. Um, they're getting cheaper and cheaper every year. You could store terabytes and terabytes of data. Um, but the way these work, uh, there's actually a picture of a hard drive here on the slide. Um, we store a bit of data by orienting a magnetic current. So we have a little piece of this disk that is maybe oriented to north, another piece of the disk that's oriented to south, maybe another part that's oriented to north, and we have a little little wand that's going around this disk and reading bits in it. So you're reading a north, north, south, north, north, south, whatever, and we're interpreting those as zeros and ones. Um, hard drives are uh, susceptible to mechanical failure. If you look, there's a little arm right here. So hard drives uh, break easily. Um, they're susceptible to being jostled. Uh, they're susceptible to strong magnetic currents. And so they're delicate, but you can store lots and lots of data with them. Uh, there's also magnetic tape. If you were to go to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., there's a lot of data stored on magnetic tape. And there's currently discussions about how to move all of that really delicate but important data um, from magnetic tape over to a more permanent storage method. Um, and then optical storage. Again, this is getting less and less popular every year. But the first, uh, the first CD-ROM, or the first uh, album I think I ever owned in the early 90s, I bought it on CD. That was really popular in the 1990s, early 2000s. Um, if you go to the red box uh, at the grocery store to rent a video, you can still get a DVD or a Blu-ray, but you see less and less of them every year. Um, what happens for optical storage, like a CD-ROM or a DVD or a Blu-ray, um, similar to magnetic storage with uh, north and south orientations for little magnetic pieces on the disk, for optical storage, what you have is parts of the disk are, that are shiny and parts of the disk that are kind of dull. And you have a laser that goes over that, that DVD and the parts of the disk that reflect light, you can interpret that as a zero. The parts that don't reflect light, you can uh, represent that as a one. And so again, you could store bits on a DVD because the areas that reflect or don't reflect light, you've got your zeros and ones. You have your data representation there. Hardware ab abstraction. Um, I already talked about this last chapter, but it's good to remind you again, it's important material. Um, the idea here is that we can build on top of um, more complicated layers. So at the bottom of a computer, it's really complicated because you have a bunch of transistors. They can all be set to zeros and ones. It would be very hard to program if our only option for programming um, was, was setting zeros and ones on the transistors of a computer. But if you take a bunch of transistors, collect those together, like I mentioned before, you can create a logic gate, which can do AND and OR logic. Then if you take a bunch of logic gates and put those together, you can create a digital circuit. If you take a bunch of digital circuits together, you can create a microchip. If you take a bunch of microchips together, um, you can create high-level hardware like a motherboard or storage devices or peripherals. And you take a bunch of those and put them together, and you've got a computer. Um, this is a block diagram of a computer. I think you guys should take the time to write this down. If you need to, you know, raise your hand and ask for the video to be paused. That's certainly something that, that you should do right now. Um, but I'll talk through the diagram as you're writing it down. Um, so a computer, just like any other computing innovation that we've talked about in this course, has the same basic architecture. 
It takes some data as input, it transforms that data, and then it produces some output. Now when we're talking input for a computer, what we're talking there are the peripherals, the keyboard, the mouse, the microphone, um, a camera, whatever devices you have plugged into the computer that allows data to go in, typically the keyboard and the mouse being the two most important. So that's how that computer will take data as input. Now once that input is received, um, inside of the computer, there's three main places that you should understand that work is happening. There's the CPU, the central processing unit. So when we talk about the processor for a computer, this is the part of the computer that is basically doing the math. Um, it's running calculations, it's transforming that data, it's taking that input and it's running those computer programs and taking that input and, and transforming it. Um, now, when these calculations are performed, sometimes the data goes to RAM for temporary storage. Sometimes it goes to a hard drive for long-term storage. Sometimes it goes from RAM and then goes back to the processor and then goes into long-term storage. So there's, there's a transfer of data between these three areas. But the CPU is where all of the calculations happen. RAM is where all of the temporary storage happens. Um, and then your hard drive, your SD card, that's where all of your long-term storage of data happens. And then finally, we have some sort of output, right? Um, that's where whatever you typed into the computer that gets processed by the computer shows up on the screen. And that output, that data will be displayed either on your monitor, um, printed out to your printer or 3D printer, um, played as sound on your speakers. So those are your output peripherals. So again, a computer takes data as input, transforms that data, and then produces some sort of data as output. And again, if you need this video paused, um, feel free to raise your hand, but this is an important diagram uh, to have a basic understanding of. This is not a digital electronics course, so you don't need to know in, in really excruciating detail how a computer works, but I do recommend having this overall big picture idea of how a computer works. Um, I'm using the term computer here loosely. Um, your phone in your pocket is a computer. It meets all of the criteria that you see on the screen. Um, even, yeah, your iPad that the, that the school provided to you meets all of the criteria here as well. Um, and one thing I do recommend, certainly not something that you have to do, but if you are interested in computers and how computers work, I mean, how the hardware side of a computer actually functions. Um, at some point in your life, you might consider building a computer. Um, I did this with my brother when I was in my early 20s. My brother was building computers in high school. You really get a good idea of how a computer works. And what I mean by build a computer, I don't, I don't mean that I had a soldering iron out and I was actually, um, you know, soldering circuits and, and crazy things like that. I mean that um, when I needed a new computer, my brother and I went online ordered all the individual parts for the computer. We ordered a processor, we ordered a motherboard, um, we ordered the case for the computer, we ordered a hard drive, we ordered all of the patch cables for, for cabling everything together. And then we watched a bunch of YouTube videos and we put all of the pieces together. And then at the end of that, I had, after some troubleshooting, I had a working computer. Um, it's a great activity to do with a parent or a sibling if that's something that they're interested in as well. Um, certainly not a required part of this course, but it is, it is actually something that's worth doing. You, you would enjoy it. All right, so let's go back and talk about logic gates. I, I kind of went through that hardware abstraction. We built up to the high level part of a computer. Let's go back to some low level functionality for a computer. So you do need to know what a logic gate is for this course. You don't need to know how to, how to program one, or you don't need to know how to actually wire one. We don't, we don't worry about the hardware aspect of it, but you do need to know that a logic gate is a low-level hardware abstraction that's made out of transistors, and what it does is it handles true-false logic. It handles Boolean logic. Um, I have a couple examples here with logic gates, so we'll get to practice with them. You'll see the sorts of questions uh, that you'll see on the AP test about logic gates. So let's start with an AND gate. You can wire up a, uh, a logic gate in such a way that it can handle AND logic. Here's how AND logic works. So if both inputs into an AND gate are true, 
then the output will also be true. Uh, the requirement here is that A and B must both be true um, in order for an AND gate to return true. So basically, if A is true and B is true, an AND gate will output the value true. On the other hand, if one or both of the values for A and B are false, an AND gate will output false. So let's say that A is false, but B is true. An AND gate will output false. Suppose that A is false and B is false. An AND gate will output false. If A is true and B is false, an AND gate will still return false. So the only way to make an AND gate return true, output the value true, is for both A and B to be true. That's how an AND gate works. And the idea there, I mean, you, you can kind of hear the AND in it, right? If A and B are true, then an AND gate returns true. That's the idea with that. If A and B are true, then an AND gate returns true. Um, and everything I just said is kind of summarized down here. So everything I was showing you in the picture is summarized in this, these little notes. Um, there's also OR gates. So let's look at an OR gate. The idea for an OR gate is if either C or D are true, then our output will be true. So the idea here, let's say that C is true and D is false. An OR gate will say, well, only C or D had to be true. Um, since C was true, we output true. And you could try it in the other order. You could say, oh, well, if C is false, but D is true, that's okay, because either C or D had to be true. Since D was true, our output is true. Interesting thing with an OR gate is since C or D, one of those had to be true, both of them can be true. So if C or D is true, the output is true. That's It's okay if C is true and D is true also. The only way to make an OR gate false there's only one way to do it, and that would be if C were false and D were false, then your OR gate would, would have an output of false. Um, and everything I just said is kind of summarized here in these notes. If I'm going too fast at any point, just you know, raise your hand for the video to be paused. Um, and here's the sort of thing you're going to see on the AP test you will have to do some uh, you know, basic, um, basic calculations with AND gates and OR gates. So let's do this first little question here. It says, if inputs R and T are both true, so if R were true and T were true, what must S equal in order for the OR gate to produce an output of true? Oh, you know what though, if T is already true, it doesn't really matter what this AND gate produces. So suppose S were false. Well, this AND gate would return false. But our OR gate, we have true, false. Well, only T or this other input had to be true. Since T was already true, this would output true. Now, if you kind of erase here and you try again and you say, um, what would happen if S were true? Well, if S were true, our AND gate, since R and S are true, our AND gate would return true. True or true still outputs true. So for the first question, um, it doesn't matter what S equals. S can be true or false. It does not matter. Now let me erase and let's look at the next question. Maybe I'll switch colors here so we kind of can see the transition. Let me kind of erase this all this excess ink. Let me switch colors here. And the next question is, if R has a value of false, okay, if R has a value of false, what must S and T equal in order for the OR gate to produce an output of true? Um, well, let's see. If T were false, if t ended up being false. 
um, our AND gate is going to be returning false, and then T is false, and then our OR gate would, would, would return false. Oh, so that's bad. So let's be careful there. So R has a value of false. You know what, though? I think if T were true, then it wouldn't really matter what S is. Um, because no matter what, whether, you know, just because you're getting a false popping out there, um, because T was true, our output would be true. Um, so I think what matters here is that T sure as heck better be true. But then S, I don't think it matters. And the reason I don't think S really matters so much is because no matter what value S has, this AND gate is going to be returning false at this point, because if R is false, then we're kind of done there. Um, anyway, we could talk about this more in class on Tuesday, so if you guys have any questions about working with AND and OR gates, um, feel free to ask in class. I have no problem with that. But I think we'll move along for now, and we can do more examples on Tuesday if you need them. All right, so this is an activity that we were going to do. Um, but since I'm not in class, we're not going to do it. Uh, let me explain how it was going to work, though. So you are going to work with your partner to try to communicate information using bits. So one partner was going to have their eyes closed, and the other partner was going to have treasure in a little treasure chest. So um, the idea here was to figure out which treasure chest has the, the treasure, treasure chest A, or treasure, treasure chest B. And the way the communication was gonna to have to happen for saying where the treasure was, you weren't gonna be able to say in words that the treasure is in A or the treasure is in B. I was gonna give you a little LED light. And that LED light was gonna be able to be switched to on or switched to off. And basically the idea was if the LED light was off, maybe you would say that that meant that the treasure was in A, and if the LED light was switched to on, that would mean that the treasure was in B. So you could communicate, when the other person opens their eyes, they could see the state of that LED light, and they would know where the treasure was, and they'd be able to find it. Uh, the idea there is that we can use bits to communicate information, because an LED light that's switched to off or on, that can represent, of course, a zero or a one, or if you agree to it ahead of time, it could represent a treasure chest A, or a treasure chest B. So that's what you guys were gonna, were gonna do if I was here today. Um, let's step it up a notch. Now let's say there's more treasure chests. So now we could say that there are three treasure chests and I would give you two LED lights. So you would have LED light number one. So you have an LED light that could be switched to on or off and then another LED light that could be switched to on or off. And again, your job would be to communicate to your partner where the treasure was. So one person would have closed their eyes. And while their eyes were closed, I would tell you which treasure chest has the treasure. And then you were going to have to communicate which one it was using those LED lights. And eventually what most groups would come to is they would say, okay, if the first light is off and the second light is off, that's going to represent treasure chest zero. If the first light is off and the second light is on, that would represent treasure chest number one. And if both lights were on, that would represent treasure chest two. Uh, there's another solution you could have said if the first light is on but the second one is off, that could represent two. Mathematically speaking, probably the better one is the one zero. You'll see why in a, in a uh, later later chapter, but either of these solutions would have worked. Um, and any encoding that you guys came up with would have been an acceptable solution. So as long as you found some way to switch, to switch the lights on and off to communicate where the treasure was, that was going to be an acceptable answer. And then we were, we were going to do one more. Um, we were going to try four treasure chests. And again, off, 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 on, on, off, on, on. Um, those would be the four different states where you can communicate where the treasure was. So it would have been fun, um, and maybe, you know, maybe in class we'll try something like it um, 
for a future activity, maybe something a little bit more complicated. And you guys can see how to communicate data using bits. That's the main idea here is how can we communicate data when all we have are light switches? Um, and we could do better than this, right? Because look at this, you know, we, now we have yellow, we have blue, we have purple, we have green. We could say, oh, well, this data doesn't can't doesn't just represent treasure chests. We can actually encode colors, right? We can encode yellow, we can encode blue, we can encode purple, we can communicate green. So the idea is almost any kind of data that you can imagine, whether it's letters, whether it's numbers, whether it's colors, whether it's sounds, um, we could communicate that data using bits. The only thing that matters is that um, we have a way of interpreting those bits. So a way of looking at your binary data and saying, oh, well, we've already agreed that a zero zero means the color yellow or a zero one means the color blue. Um, so the idea here is it's kind of data abstraction It's this idea of using bits to represent different kinds of data. And that's why we like having bits on a computer, because we can represent any kind of data that we can imagine. All right, so um, one other thing that, it, that we can kind of notice here is the first set of treasure chests. I don't know if you noticed this, but I had labeled them treasure chest A and B. And we were representing those as um, a zero and a one. What's going on there is we can represent letters using binary bits. If we set a, um, you know the, the light to zero, that can represent the letter A. If we set the light to on or one, uh, we can use that to represent the letter B. So we can we can use binary bits to represent letters. Same thing with numbers. Um, the second set of treasure chests, I had treasure chest zero, treasure chest one, treasure chest two. And we were able to represent those numbers, zero, zero, uh, zero, one, and one, zero. Even colors. The third set of treasure chests um, were yellow, blue, purple, and green, and we were able to refer to those with binary digits, with binary bits, so we can represent colors using binary data. The idea here is basically any kind of data that you can imagine, you can represent that data using binary digits. Uh, the important thing being that everybody kind of agrees how to interpret those binary bits. Um, so we have, we have schemes out there, we have encodings that say, okay, when you write 001100, that represents the color, say, red or green or, or whatever. Um, one thing that might be nice to know is how many bits you need to represent you know, certain kinds of data. So if you, wanna, um, if you want to represent two different things, two distinct items, a yes or a no, a zero or a one, a true or false, you need only one bit for that because that bit can be switched on or off. On for one item, off for the other item. For three distinct items, you saw that with the treasure chests, I wish we were able to do the LED light activity, but you would have seen that you needed two bits in order to represent three items. For four items, you still only need two bits. Um, the reason that you only need two bits is um, think about those two bits. You have on or off for the first, on or off for the second. Well, that's two times two equals four different things that you can represent. For five items, you would need three bits. For eight items, you would need three bits. Um, now I'll talk a little bit more about it in, in the coming slides, but you might wonder how am I figuring out how many bits that I need? Well, um, I know that one bit can represent two things. Two bits, when I have two bits, that means I have a switch that can be on or off, and I have another switch that can be on or off. Well, the first switch has two different states that it can be in. The other switch has two different states that it can be in. I can represent four distinct things. And then with the five or the eight, um, I know if I have three bits, I've got three light switches. The first light switch could be on or off. The second light switch can be on or off. The third light switch could be on or off. Well, that means that the first light switch has two states it can be in. 
The second switch has two states it can be in. The third switch has two states that it can be in. That's two to the third, or eight distinct items that I can represent with three bits. All right, let's move along and I'll, I'll kind of build on this idea. So in general, if you have n bits available to you, if you have n light switches available, you can represent two to the n distinct items. Um, so how many distinct colors can you represent with six bits? Two to the six. How many distinct integers can you represent with eight bits? Two to the eight. Now you could kind of turn the uh, turn this question on its head and you could say, how many bits do I need to represent all 26 lowercase letters of the alphabet? Well, I need two to the n such that that n is bigger than 26. Um, I know that, here, let me switch colors here, but I'm going to show you, I'll do a little bit of a calculation up at the top here. Um, if I have one bit, I can represent two things. If I have two bits, I can represent four things. Three bits, eight things. You guys can see where this is going. Four bits, 16 things. And finally, if I have five bits, I can represent 32 distinct items. Well, if I have 32 distinct items with five bits, that's more than 26. 32 is greater than 26. So I need five bits to represent all 26 letters of the alphabet. And then I have some bits left over, right? I have some states um, that are not being assigned to letters, but you can have them represent maybe grammatical symbols, like punctuation or something. Um, so there's more data that you can represent with five bits than just 26, but 26 is the minimum number of bits you need to represent all 26 letters of the alphabet. By the way, uh, this is something that needs to make it into your notes. If you have more data than you have bits available, that's called an overflow error. You'll see it happen this year. We're going to do some practice problems. Um, we'll look at some situations where we have more data than we have bits to store it, and we'll talk about overflow errors happening as a result. All right, let's move right along here. Um, after bits, we talk about something called bytes. Um, it gets a little bit cumbersome to always be talking about bits, zeros and ones, ons and offs. Uh, first of all, humans are not great with zeros and ones, right? Saying that, oh, the color green is represented by the binary string 01101100000111111101 or something. That that's not actually green. I'm you know I'm just making up a, a random string of bits there. But you know if every time you had to talk about green, and you had to ring read the string of bytes, you're gonna lose people pretty quickly because humans are not great um, at at mentally storing data using bits. Computers are very good at it. Humans are not great at it. So what we'll often do is we'll collect eight bits together and we'll call that a byte. So if you have eight bits of data, say a 11001010, this would be a byte of data because it's eight bits. Now, computers these days can store lots and lots of bits. We have transistors with, with billions upon billions uh, we have we have chips with billions upon billions of transistors and so even a byte doesn't store that much data by modern standards so sometimes we'll group together a thousand bytes and we'll call it a kilobyte um, by the way you will find other areas of computer science where they'll say 1024 bytes is a kilobyte they say that because 2 to the 10th power is 1024. And so basically they'll, they'll group together using powers of 2 instead of group together um, using thousands. There is some disagreement between computer scientists, which is the right way to do it. But for the AP test, they use a thousand bytes in a kilobyte. So therefore, we're going to use that standard as well. Um, I have more units of measure on the next slide. But as you might, might realize, even a kilobyte by modern standards is not viewed as a lot of data. Um, it is a lot of data when you think about it, right? Because it's a thousand bytes and each byte being 
8 bits, so it's a lot of on and off switches. Even one kilobyte is lots and lots of ons and off switches. Um, but computers are so good at storing so much data these days that we have other units of measure that you're probably familiar with. Um, feel free to, to have this, uh, this slide paused. I would try to get a lot of this written down, at least up through terabyte. I think that the, the top of this table is pretty important. Um, a bit is just a single on or off switch. Um, occasionally, you'll hear about a nibble, which is four bits. Uh, not too often, but every once in a while, you'll, you'll read a reference to a nibble, which would be half of a byte, four bits. So a byte is eight bits. Um, you can kind of see there's a little, little joke in this, right? So a byte, um, well, if you want less than a byte, you just take a nibble. So that's, I don't know, it's, the, it's kind of a joke, but it, it exists. Um, anyway, a kilobyte is a thousand bytes. A megabyte is a thousand kilobytes. A gigabyte is a thousand megabytes. And a terabyte is a thousand gigabytes. I mean, this is crazy when you think about it. When you think about just how many ons and off switches, how many zeros and ones, how many transistors go into something like a terabyte, it's just mind boggling. Um, and these days, even a terabyte is starting, I mean, that's still a lot of data, like a terabyte, you could store a lot on a one terabyte hard drive. Um, but hard drives and data storage is getting so cheap and so pervasive these days, even a terabyte is starting to sound small. So I would not be surprised if in our future, maybe fewer years in the future than we think, you might be going to a store and buying a one petabyte cell phone, a cell phone that can store a petabyte of data. I don't think that's, that's out of the realm of possibility in the near future. Um, and then once you're talking petabytes and exabytes and zettabytes, um, we're talking a lot of data. The last thing I want to show you guys, this is our last uh, slide. This is a calculation that you guys should know how to do. It's a conversion example. If you've taken uh, chemistry before, like for any of the basically sophomores through seniors in the class, if you've taken a chemistry class and you did dimensional analysis, this is a dimensional analysis problem, so you should be familiar with this stuff. Um, but we should all learn how to do this. So if someone asks, how many bits are in a 3.291 megabyte uh, music file? Here's how you do the calculation. You say, okay, I've got 3.291 megabytes. And you put that over one, make it into a fraction. Then you look at your conversion chart and you say, well, wait a minute though. There are a thousand kilobytes in one megabyte. Oh, but wait a minute. There's also a thousand bytes in one kilobyte. Oh, but wait a minute. There's eight bits in one byte. So you just set up a bunch of conversions. Then you just kind of simplify the fractions. You say, oh, megabytes over megabytes cancel kilobytes over kilobytes cancel, bytes over bytes cancel. Oh, my only remaining units are bits. So I know that I've successfully converted to bits. So then you just have to go into your calculator and you just do 3.291 multiplied by 1,000, multiplied by 1,000, multiplied by eight. You just literally do that in a calculator and you get your answer from that. You get 26,328,000 bits. So think about how wild that is. That's a 3.291 megabyte music file is a small music file. That's probably about a two minute song, if not shorter than a two minute song. And to encode, to store that two minute song on your phone or on your computer, um, there are 26,328,000 little on off switches switched to the correct positions to represent that song. Uh, if you guys think this stuff is pretty cool, um, there's a digital electronics class that's taught at Friend through the Applied Tech Department. Or um, when you're thinking about careers someday or college majors, one major you could consider is computer engineering. Uh, computer engineering, you do do some programming, but you work a lot with just actually the hardware and the bits and the bytes and the binary of computers.
Um, if you go to college and, and major in computer science, that's more just about the programming of a computer and a lot less about the hardware. Anyway, guys, thanks for listening. Uh, this video is on YouTube, so feel free to rewind if there's anything that you missed or that you need to get back to. Um, have a great three-day weekend. Stay safe. I will see you guys on Tuesday.